Dr. Kaner, welcome back to Issues Etc. Thank you, Tom. Dr. Kaner, first of all, give us a list of the various um, types or sects within Islam. Oh, good gracious. Uh, if you were going to try to list them, there are, uh, according to Islamic sources, close to 50. Now, of the major types, they all fit sort of like Christianity fits into Protestant, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox. Um, within Islam, there is the major uh, three, and that is Sunni, Shiite, and Sufi. Um, but then you have many, many subsets, such as Alawit, Wahhabi, Druze, uh, and others. Okay, let's deal with the major three, if we could, and, and maybe if we have time, we might be able to spend some time in the, in the larger of the lesser sects of Islam. Before we get into those three, what accounts for the divisions in Islam? Is there a point in history where we can... Uh... Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Um, as, as you know, when, the, when Muhammad died in 632 A.D., when Muhammad died, he did not leave marching orders. Uh, his death caught him and his followers uh, by surprise, and um, you had a power struggle, for lack of a better term, a power struggle over who would be the leader. It came down to one major question. Um, if, the, if the leader of Islam, who, no, nobody else is called a prophet, as you know. Everyone is called a caliph. But if the caliph um, is going to be a genetic, you know, blood relative, so to speak, of Muhammad, that's the answer. Uh, the Shiites believed he must be a, you know, must be by heritage from the house of Muhammad, and they were followers of uh, one who was called Ali, and they said it has to be someone Ali married Muhammad's daughter, and so, uh, you know, it must be this. But Muhammad's best friend and the first convert to Islam was named Abu Bakr, and Abu Bakr was the by proxy leader of Islam. The rest of the Muslims decided to follow Abu Bakr, and uh, they became Sunni. About 90 percent. 10% split. Uh, to this day, it still holds about 85%, 10%, and then 5% for the other groups. So 85% of the world Muslims f fall into the category of known as the Sunni, and they trace, they trace their heritage to Abu Bakr, who they believe was the first caliph. Because the 10% uh, the of the Muslims were, you know, did not get their way, they split. They split completely off, and they became followers of the Way, or Shia, and uh, thus we have the term Shiites. They, did not, uh, they don't recognize any caliph until Ali, who was actually the fourth caliph according to the Sunni. Now, between the Sunnis and the Shiites, are these the, the only major differences between these two sects? Oh, of no, 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 no. And that's a, that's a very prescient question. I rarely get asked that. That's good um, to be asked. The, there are many differences between them. Uh, the third major group are the Sufi. And uh, for lack of a better term, the Sufi fall into the care, uh, category of perhaps the charismatics of the Muslim world, the mystics of the Muslim world. Um, when someone asks me, do you believe that Islam is a, a peaceful religion, I will say there are sects that are peaceful. And the Sufi, S-U-F-I, the Sufi have built their entire uh, Islamic system on peace. Uh, they deny any kind of jihad. They deny any kind of outward acts of, of uh, warfare, with, with the, some exceptions, with some small exceptions. And so the Sufi, you know, have built their belief system on, on um, an activity of peace. The Shiites and the Sufi uh, and the Sunni, they differ on their interpretations of the six ways, the five pillars, and the use of the Hadith, H-A-D-I-T-H. Um, this is huge. The Hadith is the great unknown in American Islam. Uh, as far as our American culture is concerned, we don't, we don't really know much about We know the Quran, but we don't know the Hadith. The Hadith were the sayings of Muhammad. And uh, the sayings of Muhammad collected by al-Bukhari and al-Muslim and uh, a couple of others, these collections become the, the constitution for any Islamic state. And so when the Shiites say they are much more um, uh, adherent to Islam, what they are meaning is they, they adhere to a stricter form of the Hadith. Is this, we hear sometimes, and the term is not thrown around so much as it was about 20 years ago, Islamic fundamentalists or fundamentalism. What is generally being signaled by, by that particular uh, Western characterization? Yeah. yeah, that is Western characterization. There's no such thing. Um, when, when someone says, oh, he's, a, he's an Islamic extremist, um, this is sort of what we hear now in our American culture. We say, well, those who follow jihad, they are extremists. Uh, only in America would this ever be said. Myself, I am Turkish, uh, 20 generations back Muslim. You know, I'm the first Christian. Um, I converted to Jesus Christ as Lord, Savior, and God, um, you know, when I was in, uh, senior in high school. 
Um, we never hear this term extremist. They believe they are strict purists. They adhere to the Quran. As a matter of fact, when Ben Laden comes on television, you know, or, or has a recording released, the first group to which he speaks are not the infidels, not the akafir, but he speaks to the other Muslims and he says, you have been obliged, you have been fardain, is the Arabic term, you have been fardain, you've been obliged to holy war, what is holding you back? Now, uh, do the Shiites consider the Sunnis to be heretical, or, and, and vice versa? <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There is a uh, gulat, uh, the term gulat means cult. Uh, they, they, con they consistently declare each other cults um, for a number of reasons. For instance, uh, as it applies to our present conflict, in Iraq, uh, we are having discussions even yesterday over uh, who, will, who will run the country. And we saw just a few days ago a Shiite imam hacked to death. Actually, he was an ulima, a scholar, hacked to death because he was seen to be complicitous with uh, Saddam Hussein. Why would that be of any importance? Well, the thing to remember about Iraq is this. It has been minority run. It has been like South Africa. 20% uh, of the Muslims in Iraq, only 20%, are Sunni. 60, and I would, I would argue that perhaps closer to 70, percent of the Muslims in Iraq are Shiite. And so Hussein has constantly had a war against the Shiites. As a matter of fact, after the last Gulf War, he bombed um, one of the, uh, the Shiite holy sites, which was the, uh, the place of death for Muhammad's uh, grandson, Hussein. Um, and, and because there was such an outcry against Hussein for doing so, Saddam Hussein for doing so, he had to help rebuild those sites. Now, you mentioned the, the conflict in Iraq. Of what, at least ostensibly, of what sect is is or was Saddam Hussein a member? Yeah, and I think you said it very clearly when you say ostensibly. Uh, ostensibly, he he was a Sunni, and now even Osama bin Muhammad bin Laden, um, the leader in the Taliban, he believed that Hussein was a bad Muslim. He dressed in secular garb. He only wore uh, the gefia uh, when he needed to, and so he was seen as a bad Muslim. What is interesting is that uh, Ben Laden is a Wahhabi, and the Wahhabi are a subset of the Sunni. They are a subset. And so because of this, they had more in common than, say, Ben Laden and the old Ayatollah Khomeini. They would not have anything in common because that's Sunni versus Shiite. These are two subsets of Sunni, Ben Laden and Hussein, and this is why when somebody says, oh, there was no connection, oh my goodness, Anyone who understands Islam knows there's a, an incredible connection between the two, and anyone who has followed history knows that there was an incredible connection between the two. That is the reason why they called for a fatwa uh, after the bombing started, that uh, bin Laden called his followers to uh, join with uh, Saddam Hussein. They, were, they are joined together as uh, two denominations within the same, uh, within the, within the same movement. Um, as, uh, one more question on Saddam Hussein. How would it be perceived by any Muslim, regardless of their of their uh, sect in in, uh, in Islam, for essentially a secular leader such as Saddam Hussein to uh, portray himself in the art of propaganda as a as a great teacher of Islam and to use um, Islam and its teachings toward his own secular and geopolitical purposes? Well, some would say that the, the movement now of uh, what they would call, again, Islamists or uh, extreme Islam are using it for geopolitical aims. I always make the point that, um, and we just came back from Washington, D.C., where I dealt with this, this is not geopolitical. Uh, the last words that Hussein said on that videotape before, you know, after the bombing that began that Wednesday, some month ago, he said, long live Iraq. Long live the Iraqi people and long live jihad, holy war. This is not for them a battle against America, the great geopolitical superpower, the only surviving superpower. This is against America, the perceived Christian nation. And this is their crusade. That's why it's declared as jihad. Some, some have speculated that, uh, that America, in positioning itself, and we've only got a minute here before we go to break, America positioning itself in this war with Iraq. Um, will unite Muslims, regardless of their various denominations, um, against America? Is that a fair characterization? No, no. I think it will unite some Muslims, um, but it will not. Nothing will unite Sunni and Shiite and Sufi in any common cause. They they will always have a fundamental uh, distrust, dislike, distaste for one another. 
When we come back from this break, we're going to continue our conversation with Dr. Ergen Kainer. He's professor of theology and church history at Criswell College in Dallas, Texas. He's co-author of the book Unveiling Islam and a forthcoming book, More Than a Prophet. We're talking about the different kinds or the different types of Muslim. If you have a question or a comment on this subject, feel free to use our call-in number, 505-7850 or 1-800-730-2727. I think with only with respect at this point to our present conflict in Iraq and the future, it seems that we would all do well to understand the theological and cultural differences within Islam. We might understand a little bit better. We might actually be able to understand some things that seem broadly misunderstood. I've got a question for Dr. Kaner when we come back, and that has to do with whether or not the Bush administration and the American people in general would do well to understand these differences better and how things might change if they did. We'll be right back. The radio voice of the Lutheran faith for the 21st century. You're listening to Issues Etc. What did Jesus say and do on the night he was arrested? In our Issues Etc. Book of the Month for April, the very first Easter, Dr. Paul Meyer retells for your family and your children the story of Jesus' betrayal, arrest, crucifixion, and resurrection. You can order the very first Easter online. Go to our website at issuesetc.org. Under the What's New section, you'll find information on this book, issuesetc.org, or call Concordia Publishing House weekdays during regular business hours at 1-800-325-3040. When you call or write, be sure to ask for the Issues Etc. Book of the Month for April, the very first Easter. The cost is $12.99, 1-800-325-3040. Call weekdays during regular business hours, 1-800-325-3040. By death came man. Now who said that? Answers with Ken Ham, author of the powerful book, Genesis and the Decay of the Nations. Now, Ken, you've often said that the Bible teaches that it was man's sin that brought death, but Charles Darwin said something quite different, right? Well, in Darwin's scheme of things, he saw war, famine, and death as being good because they generated the higher animals and finally man himself. You see, right at the end of Darwin's book, The Origin of the Species, he said, quote, Thus from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of higher animals, directly follows, end of quote. In other words, what Darwin said was this, By death came man. Things that we should see as terrible and ugly, such as war, famine, and death, Darwin actually considered good because they're a part of the process of evolution. You know, this belief is in sharp contrast to what the Word of God says. We're told in Corinthians that by man came death, exactly the opposite of what Darwin taught. This is a very important point. So many Christians think they can add evolution to the Bible, but it's impossible. You see, sin led to death. That key biblical teaching that sin leads to death is covered in much more detail in Ken's booklet, Why Is There Death and Suffering? To get your free copy, go to our popular and attractive website, AnswersRadio.com. Next time you're surfing the Internet, go to AnswersRadio.com. Five thirty one at AM eight fifty KFUO. Weather for St. Louis. Occasional showers overnight, low of about fifty one for tomorrow, mostly cloudy with a continued chance for rain. High near seventy two right now, overcast and seventy in St. Louis. Another look at St. Louis traffic. Westbound forty is heavy and slow west of Kings Highway to Hanley, Brentwood to McKnight, and bumper to bumper from Ballast to Mason. Westbound seventy stop and go from one seventy to the Rock Road. Westbound 44 is slow in the right lane at 270. Northbound 270 slows Page to Dorset, then in the right lanes exiting onto westbound 70. Eastbound 40 between Jefferson and the Poplar Street Bridge. There's some heavy traffic there. And northbound 55 between Park Avenue and the Poplar Street Bridge. Slow traffic in the right lane. That's traffic and weather on AM850 KFUO. Do you ever have a question or a comment that you would like to share with the staff at AM850 KFUO? Why not send us an email? It's fast and easy. Our main email address is webmaster at kfuo.org 
R for staff email addresses, go to KFUO.org and click the Contact KFUO button. We enjoy receiving your questions and comments, so feel free to contact us. Our main email address, again, is webmaster at KFUO.org. Friday on Issues Etc. We're going to be talking with uh, Dr. Norman Nagel. This is a rare opportunity to have Dr. Nagel in studio and to walk with him through the seven words of Christ from the cross that are recorded in the four Gospels. We'll be dealing with every one of them and having his unique insights on each Friday on Issues Etc. The General Conversation, The Passion of Jesus Christ. Also Friday, a two-hour discussion on the events of Passion Week with Dr. Lane Berglund, author of Reading the Bible, with understanding. Now, if you have a question or a comment on Islam, you can give us a call in the next 25 minutes of the program. We're talking with Dr. Ergen Kaner, author of the book Unveiling Islam. Our call in numbers are 505 7850 or 1 800 730 2727. Let's go to Kurt, who's calling from his car. Kurt, welcome to Issues, etc. Thank you. Uh, your guest said that uh, the way he was talking was it was well nigh impossible for Shiites and uh, Sunni to make common cause. Well, how in the world did Saddam Hussein uh, get many of, of his uh, Shiite soldiers, if, if, if it's true that 70% of Iraq is, is Shiite, to fight a, a very bloody war with uh, Shiite Iran? Did, did he have to go behind them with a pistol and force them to fight? I don't, I don't think that happened. Uh, actually, it did happen in many cases. This is what we continue to hear about um, the coercion of the Fedayeen, um, men being you know, dragged out of their homes uh, and told you have to fight at pistol point. However, on the deeper question, um, many of the Shiite Muslims who had lived under the uh, Hussein uh, regime had been born and raised in this. Uh, you have to understand it has been Sunni rule in Iraq since 1921. Of course, um, following World War I, uh, at the time, the Lord of the Admiralty was uh, Winston Churchill. And Churchill uh, turned over the country, the newly formed country of Iraq, um, to, the, to the leadership of the, of the Sunni. And so many of the Muslims have known nothing else in Iraq since then. Now, of course, uh, from what, 21 through almost World War II, you had a, a, the British stronghold, and then when the British left, they saw the British as the enemy. So when the British left, even if it's Hussein, uh, and he's a Muslim that we do not like, and of course uh, their mosques and our mosques are not the same, say the Shiites, um, he's still one of us. He's still a Muslim, even though he is not our type of Muslim. You can compare this again to perhaps the uh, Peace of Westphalia, uh, the warfare between the Reformation movements, uh, the Lutheran movement and the French-Swiss movement and the German-Swiss movement. Let's go back to the phones. Matt is calling from Richmond Heights. Matt, welcome to Issues Etc. Thank you. I would like to ask, uh, I heard the other day on the radio that uh, Saddam Hussein was a, uh, his family anyway, his parents were Christians and their predecessors. I wondered, uh, Dr. Keener, is that true? Uh, I'm sorry, I barely heard what he said. He had, he had asked, he said he had heard that Saddam Hussein's parents, at the very least, were Christians. Is this true? Well, no, I have heard, I've heard not, uh, a number of these things, but they are, as far as I know, all just rumor. Um, if it's uh, sustained to me, I would be happy to, uh, or proven to me, I would be happy to uh, speak of it. But uh, there is one who was a leader in Hussein's uh, regime, Tariq Aziz, was called a Christian. Um, he is of the type of Christian that, that is exposed in Iraq in the public square, which is the Coptic movement. Uh, Eastern Orthodox, Coptic, uh, derivative, uh, those that uh, at the Council of Nicaea in 325 had been uh, kicked out. But uh, I have wonderful news, of course, for uh, all of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, and that is that there is an underground church uh, supported by Lutherans and uh, Baptists and others. They have, they have existed even without any kind of help, even under great stress of uh, death in many of their cases. There is an underground church in Iraq and an underground movement that will be exposed as, as we pray that religious liberty be allowed in Iraq. Uh, we will find that there is a, a body of Christ that's existed there and, and has fervently uh, shared the gospel of Jesus. Of the two major Muslim groups, the Sunnis and the Shiites, are they both equally anti-Western 
Ah, well, in our book, uh, More Than a Prophet, which comes out next month, a follow-up to uh, Unveiling Islam, we deal with the issue of um, both of these movements and uh, as far as their determination against America. In both of their, in both of their belief systems, eschatological, uh, prophetic belief systems, it is based on conquest. Uh, Islam will conquer the world. You remember now, uh, 20 years ago, Ayatollah Khomeini said, we will turn America into an Islamic nation. And that is their end and their aim. And in so doing, if uh, American Christianity gets in the way, then uh, that is their goal. In the Western world, and I guess of greatest interest in, in America in particular, of the two to seven million Muslims that are recorded here in the United States, how do the numbers break down between Sunni, Shiite, and, the, and Sufi? Yeah, this was difficult for me because, of course, I was not born in this country. Uh, I was, a, you know, my father being a Muazin, we came to this country as Islamic missionaries, to use a, an Americanized term. And I began to see the uh, panoply, I began to see the landscape of Islam. Uh, I would say a vast majority of Muslims here in America, perhaps 85%, are Sunni. Uh, I teach here in Texas. I will be teaching at Liberty University starting this fall. I think you will run into maybe most, the vast majority of the Muslims you run into are Sunni. The rest of them are divided among Shiite, Sufi on the West Coast, and Nation of Islam, which I never, I, I never saw Nation of Islam until I came to America. And on that point, it's mentioned in, in your book, uh, how would, if we can use the term mainstream Islam, view the Nation of Islam? Well, we, we saw them with a bit of a, a scant view. Um, like I said, I was never exposed to this. Na this was an American Muslim movement, uh, and it began as the five percenters, of course, um, a movement to get uh, national recognition of a black country here in America. Uh, it was not accepted from 1923, uh, when it began to form, until the 1960s. It was not accepted by mainstream Islam until uh, Malcolm made the pilgrimage. When Malcolm made Hajj, uh, the Sunni subsumed a group of the nation underneath them. There is still a political wing. There's still a political movement called the Nation of Islam, but uh, by and large they are still seen as um, an aberration. The other nation uh, was accepted into the Sunni movements, and um, you know since then they have not been known as the nation. Okay, uh, you are uh, from Turkey, and perhaps you could also clear up a few misconceptions or gaps in, in the general knowledge of people who've been consuming the war and, the, and this uh, whole international situation. Uh, via the media that does ten, tends to flatten out the distinctions that we've been trying to highlight here in this hour. Um, Turkey as a as a Muslim nation, does it have a similar makeup <laughs> of, of Muslims yeah. as does Iraq or yeah. as does the general Muslim world? Well, uh, there in your region and in St. Louis, um, you have, I'm absolutely sure, you have Muslims who are listening right now. You have hit me on my Achilles heel, so to speak, in, <laughs> in that um, Turks are viewed with great derision and, if I may be so bold as to say, with good reason. Uh, Turkey has a horrible track record when it comes to uh, human rights. Even though I'm proud to be a Turk, I'm not proud of what we have done as a country. We've slaughtered Armenians, Cossacks, we've slaughtered the Greeks. If you saw um, my big fat Greek wedding, the grandmother who would run around saying, those dirty Turks. Um, we, we've fought over Cyprus, we've fought over lands, we've slaughtered Kurds by the, by the millions. And Turkey has a horrible reputation when it comes to human rights. It also is viewed in the Islamic community sometimes with a great bit of disdain. And that is because when the Ottoman Empire fell, 1920s, it also brought with it the fall of the caliphate. The, 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 one of the things that I often speak when I speak to uh, colleges and universities is that I tell them Islam is not monolithic. We do not have just one voice. And that is because with the fall of the caliphate, you lost any unifying voice of the Islamic world. And that is, our, that is to our great, you know, the, the Muslims even would say it is Turkey's fault. The, the Western perception of Turkey is that it is uh, not an Islamic theocracy uh, like some of the other Muslim nations in the Middle East, mm -hmm. and that there are definitely more freedoms in Turkey. Is this perception true? Yes, it is, it is absolutely what you just said. It is called a secular state, and this is our hope for Iraq in that, uh, you know, like we were talking about just, just yesterday, there was the call that I Islam cannot be, I mean, Iraq cannot be a secular state. They want it to be an Islamic republic. For a country to be an Islamic republic, uh, this is important. They must adopt the Hadith. 
They must adopt the nine volumes of al-Bukhari's hadith to be their basically code of conduct, such as uh, if a man and woman are caught in adultery, the woman is stoned, the man is beaten, uh, the cutting off of the hand, the, the, the rules established by Muhammad himself. And if they establish this, there is no such thing in Islam as religious liberty. There is only religious toleration. And that is, they would allow Christians to enter their country, but you must pay a tax. You, you cannot win anybody to Jesus Christ, as the Great Commission calls us to do. But if you do, you are deported at best. But the one who is converted from Islam, the Quran and, and the Hadith are very clear. Had, for all your listeners, it is Hadith, Volume 9, Number 57, which Muhammad speaking. Muhammad says, if anyone changes his Islamic religion, kill him. Are there trends that uh, Turkey is moving toward becoming an, an Islamic Republic and uh, adopting the Hadith perhaps in the future? Yes, ab absolutely. November of 2002, um, the majority rule in Parliament was uh, sad to say, but uh, the Islamic, uh, the, what they call the jurists movement, uh, we would call in, in Turkish the jurist movement, and um, again, I'm very sorry to say, but yes, there is, there is a sign that the only secular experiment, Kemal Ataturk set it up, but the only secular experiment of an Islamic Republic, there is a strong possibility it will go the way of the uh, Ottoman Empire as well. Would you explain, one more question on Turkey, would you explain this, this distinction that eludes me, but I can, I can see it all over the situation in Iraq and in Turkey, the, the difference between uh, Turks and Kurdish? Mm. Turks. Yes, yes, of course. Um, first off, Kurds would, would um, scream at, <laughs> at hearing you refer to them as Kurdish Turks, uh, and I would too. I'm, I'm in the minority in my country. I'm in the minority in my people. I believe the Kurds have a right to their own land. Um, they are, of course, northern Iraq, southern, southeastern Turkey. Um, they are their own language. They have their own people group. They are more Middle Eastern than they are European. Um, and the Kurds have been under the Turkish rule um, for many generations. The Kurds believe, and I think rightfully so, that they have a right to self-govern. Turkey does not believe so, and um, often violently have uh, held them down and uh, kept them from uniting as their own people. As a matter of fact, the only way Turkey was involved in this last conflict is if America assured them that we would not push for a Kurdish nation. I think Turkey, if it's ever going to be accepted into NATO, must allow, must allow, um, for some type of Kurdish nation. Now, uh, back to Iraq for a moment. Given the distinctions that, uh, that, that appear there, and you, you mentioned in Iraq we're talking about 85% uh, Sunni, 10% Shiite, maybe 5% Sufi. Um, is there any possibility of some dream of a pan-Islamic government, a secular government that would have representation of all these uh, sects of Islam? I think when our president declared um, that we must respond, I, I mean, I've had protesters everywhere I speak. Uh, I speak universities and conferences and crusades and such, and there's always protesters. And when the peace protesters are there, I often tell them, regardless of how big your sign is, regardless of how against this war you are, you are still an infidel to my people. You are, st <laughs> you know, the, you are still an akafir. You still must die. And one thing that our president did when he said is he said, we are not declaring war. We are responding to a war that has been declared against us. And one, the one clear thing that got me completely on the side of this believing it, this to be a just war was he said, we must establish a democracy. This is a grand experiment. If, in fact, we establish uh, Iraq, uh, allow, if, uh, I, I absolutely believe that if the Iraqis are allowed to have a voice, they will call for a democracy. Because you cannot say that a woman will want to be in an Islamic state that says she is not allowed to be educated, or that her testimony is equal to half of that of a man, uh, or that she is not allowed to have land. Um, I think if the women and the men are allowed to vote, I think they will vote for democracy, and this, my brother, will be the first time in history, and thus a grand experiment. We're talking to Dr. Ergen Kainer. He is professor of theology and church history at Criswell College in Dallas, Texas, and author of the book, Unveiling Islam. He has a forthcoming book titled More Than a Prophet. If you'd like to join us with a question or a comment, our call in numbers are 505 7850 or 1 800 730 2727. How much do you believe the Bush administration understands the distinctions and takes seriously and takes these things into consideration the distinctions among 
Muslims that we've been discussing up to this point? Well, certainly uh, a very prescient question. The one man who was, uh, it seemed to me, to be held up as the great uh, legislator of the new Iraq is a Sunni. And I do not believe that this will work. Um, it, may, it may work as a pan-Islamic movement. But you, have, you cannot disallow for the distinctions between Sunni and Shiite. Shiites believe they have been, and they have, been oppressed by the Sunni in Iraq for so long. And they are the vast majority. And so the Shiites, Imam, if you're going to get this done, you have to do it on a tribe-by-tribe -tribe movement. Iraq is not just one country. Goodness gracious, they never existed as one country before now. They have been a series of tribes, and each tribe has an imam, uh, an ulima. An imam is a pastor. Ulima are scholars. They have, they have had their own seminaries. There's one of the great teaching centers of Shiite Islam there. You're going to have to go tribe by tribe. And if you allow fair representation, I, I'm terrified that the Bush administration does not know this, but I do know that President Bush has some good advisors. I, I pray that, he, that they make the clear case that you have to be able to find some accord between Sunni and Shiite and, and even some of the minority voices, such as the Alawites, and that's the Syrian uh, Islamic movement, and they are there in Iraq as well. Let's go back to the phones. Roland is calling from his car. Roland, welcome to Issues Etc. Fascinating topic. Thank you so much for having your guest on today. Quick question. The, whenever you see news footage of a crowd of Islamic people, they're shouting Allah Akbar, mm -hmm. or I forgive my pronunciation. No, that's, probably, that's fine. That's good. I, I don't know if it's a distinction that's too fine, but I've heard that this means one of two things. It either means God is great or it means God is greater. And if it means God is greater, greater than who or what? Yes. A tremendous question, and it shows that you pay attention rather than just <laughs> sit and, and aimlessly watch the news. Uh, Allah Akbar, which is the call to prayer, it is the call, it is what you hear from every minaret at the uh, five rakats a day, the five prayer times. Allah Akbar means Allah is great. I do not say when somebody says, uh, you know, Allah Akbar doesn't mean God is great. Um, this is only something I hear here in America. If, if you would have said to me when I was a Muslim, and I was a Muslim until I was almost 20, if you would have said to me as, when I was a Muslim that Allah and Jehovah God of the Bible are the same God, I would have been offended. As a Christian, uh, I find it blasphemous. There is no comparison. Uh, there is, it's, it, I, this is only something that we learn in America um, because they want us all to be religious. They want us all to be basically, you know, all of us are seeking the same God. You look at the 99 names of Allah in the Quran, um, they are the names of terror and the names of glory, according to uh, Islam. Uh, not one of them is imminent or intimate or personal. There is no such thing as a Muslim having a personal relationship with Allah. Uh, but what we see in the scripture <laughs> is that I come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy in a time of need, that I am a, a temple of the Holy Spirit. Um, there is an intimacy that is bespoken in Christianity that clearly distinguishes it from any other movement. Uh, whenever somebody asks me, when did I switch, I always smile and say, I switched nothing. I went from being an idolater to knowing the one true living eternal God. Our phone number is 505-7850-1-800-730-2727. Cindy's calling from South County. Cindy, welcome to Issues Etc. Thanks. I would like to know what chances um, you would feel a, uh, a government set up in Iran by our government has of existing due to the factions in the religious system and and will a government have to still be under a religious system because Turkey has is sort of like a secular state can Iran do the or can Iraq do the same thing Cindy I, thank you very much for the question I think it's the only hope we have if Iraq does not if let's just say by hypothetical situation that Iraq establishes an Islamic Republic except this time it's Shiite and not Sunni then I'm sad to say that we will be back there in another 10 years. We will have to be, and our boys will have to die again uh, in the defense of uh, those who are coming after us. This is not just an issue of uh, establishing some sort of regime. We don't want America to be established in Iraq. We want them to have freedom. Freedom means freedom of all religion. You know, I say this because the clear distinction between religious liberty and what Islam rules, which is called the Pact of Umar, uh, religious toleration, is this. 
Freedom of religion means I would fight unto the death for a Muslim's right to have a mosque in the heart of St. Louis. It also means that I have a right to stand in front of that mosque and tell them that there is no other name under heaven by which man can be saved, Jesus. If they do not have religious liberty, if they do not have a what we would call secular state, what we will see is the establishment once again where the mullahs come out of the mosque and rule the country, and the call will be for the death of the infidel. Willis is calling from Perryville. Willis, welcome to Issues Etc. Uh, yes. I'm wondering, uh, through the years, I think about 40, 45 years ago, the Lutheran Hour was broadcast in Arabic and those other languages. Is, are there quite a few people in the Middle East listening to the gospel broadcast, and is, is it uh, affecting them positively? Let Thank you, Willis. Let me tell you great news, Willis. Um, the Lutheran Hour, not only, not only here in America, but you have uh, on your mission work something that spreads into the Middle East. And please do not think, for all those who say, well, we give our money and we want to know, you know, is it being of any effect, speaking on behalf of all immigrants, I heard the gospel before I came to America. I heard it because of your transmissions, because of your work, because of the fact that you gave your money. Continue to do so, because you will never know what a profound effect it has on the lives of those. I was, I was in Islam. I was, a, I was the son of Muazin. Uh, the one who does the call to prayer. And yet I heard the gospel because of such moves as the, as the Lutheran Hour and others. You got into our lives because you got into our radios. You got into our televisions. Um, and now, because of satellite, you have an incredible opportunity. There's, this is a time for the church to rise up, uh, for the Lutheran church to rise up, for the, for the various denominations that preach the gospel of Christ as, as the only Savior to rise up. Man, this is our chance. Herman is calling from Illinois. Herman, we've only got a very short amount of time here. Welcome uh, to Issues I would like to uh, ask Dr. Kinnear if he thinks that there could be a successful division of creating three separate nations out of Iraq, a, a Sunni, uh, a Shiite, and a Kurdish. This was broached at a meeting I was at in Washington, D.C. a couple of days ago. Uh, does Iraq need to be unified? I, I do not think at the moment that there is very strong movement uh, for a division. Is it necessary? It may be. It may be. But I do not think that at the moment that that is on the table. Dr. Kaner, one last question with only a minute to respond. Uh, some might see the what seems to be intractable differences within Islam uh, as uh, basically the writing on the wall that uh, this world will be torn as Islam rises in political stature and, and spreads. This world will be torn more and more by the kind of conflict we're witnessing in the Middle East and the kind of terrorism. Is there any, is there any uh, way to mitigate that perception of what's going on? I, I, I am premillennial, pre-tribulational. I believe that the world will get worse before the rapture. I, I think that there is a certain amount of necessity for evil because man is free to choose. I do not see peace in existence until the Prince of Peace returns, um, as much as I would like to. I think the, 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 the strength of the church, however, has always been in the midst of peace or in the midst of conflict. We have always been a voice of reason and of hope and, and a voice that calls all men to love one another in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Dr. Ergen Kaner, thank you very much for being our guest. I'm honored. Dr. Ergen Kaner is professor of theology and church history at Criswell College in Dallas, Texas. He's co-author of the book Unveiling Islam and a forthcoming book, which I'm looking forward to very much, called More Than a Prophet. It can be daunting to realize that...